Hello everyone, this is Alex, and today we are talking about the string orchestra. I'll be showing you a project that I work with uh, composer Michel Carriveau. So I work as an arranger for this, which means that I accompanied the composer by taking the ideas he had in his soundtrack for virtual string instruments and apply them to a real orchestra. So the plan was, of course, to record this with real performers, which we did. And I even had the pleasure of conducting this session. And we had an amazing result, which I'll show you in a moment. And I'm showing this example to talk about the string orchestra because the cue features the string orchestra really well and can really show the different things you can do with all of these players. So basically the string orchestra is the core of the orchestra. You really can express a lot of things only with this section. There's different things you have to be aware of. First, the register you cover, because with the string orchestra, you can basically cover all the registers from the double bass to the violins. We have some subtones with the double basses who can really support all of the string orchestra and even the whole orchestra when you need it. But you also have the violins in the high register who can really bring a lot of brightness and a lot of power in the higher registers. And of course, you have the middle register who can be very flexible as well. Now, you can think of the string orchestra as a whole, but you should also consider their subgroups. So basically you have two groups of violins and this can vary between four per section to sometimes 16 per section if you have a big orchestra. Then you have the violas which is a different instrument. You basically have a register that's a fifth below the violin so you can have access to some other notes. Then you have the cellos which is a really much bigger instrument than the violins and the violas. And usually you have three or four of these as well minimum. And then you have the double basses. The double basses you can have only two of them, sometimes one. They're basically a cello but an octave lower. So all of these subgroups have different register, different possibilities, different qualities uh, to their instrument as well. The cello in the highest register can even play above the violin sometime. It can be very expressive. It's kind of the tenor of the section. Can also play in the lower register uh, to really support the, the orchestra, maybe sometime double with the double basses that play an octave lower. Now the violas have this role usually of uh, gluing the higher register with the lower register, but can also be really expressive in their lower register. They provide a very dark tone. And actually this cue features a very interesting way to approach the violas, which I'll show in a second. Now the violins, we have two subgroups of violins because basically the higher register is the one that you can have more notes in your chords. So it's quite useful to have these two groups. Sometimes you see uh, violins one and two playing an octave apart, like a melody or something. Uh, sometimes playing another harmony, like a six, Sixth, uh, parallel sixth. Sometimes they all play the same note together just to reinforce even more a melody. And finally, I went up from the cello and now back to the double basses. The double basses are really your subs in the string orchestra. And you should be careful when you use them. I like to use the double basses like for really the most important moments uh, in my music. And in this cue, we actually only use it for the climax. Now let's listen to the cue first. This is for a movie based on a novel by uh, the writer Kim Tsui. The director is uh, Charles Olivier Michaud, and uh, this is the music of Michel Corriveau, which I arranged and conducted.
Now, beautiful queue, and you might have noticed that there are not only the string, the whole string orchestra, but there are soloists within the string orchestra. And that's why I thought it was so interesting to present you this cue, is to show the diversity of sounds you can obtain within the string orchestra. And I'll be showing exactly what I do here within the score. If you don't read music, it's fine. Maybe try and tag along. I'll try to explain things as much as possible. But you should be aware of what I do here because uh, this you can also apply when you're working with virtual instruments. And I'll do different excerpts and present the MIDI in between. So firstly, you've heard the first segment is the solo cello uh, joined by the solo viola. And it's only at bar 29 that uh, the first violin comes in. And only at that point, I wanted to add in the violas and the cellos, uh, the rest of the group. So that's where you write 2T. That means that all four of the violas and the cellos will come in at this point. Our first violin here, uh, you can hear, is coming out very nicely. This is my favorite passage, by the way, uh, from 29 to 34. It just reminds me of some great soundtracks uh, from movies and even video games. I was a big player of the Elder Scroll uh, series, so it just reminds me of Skyrim, basically. And this has something to do with the indication about the vibrato. Senza vib, that means senza vibrato uh, in Italian, and then con vibrato. So we really we're careful here because by default, string players will do vibrato or a certain amount of vibrato. If you don't want a vibrato, you should really specify it. So we really wrote when we wanted a little vibrato, so we have poco vibrato here, and when we didn't want any of it. And this is what makes this unique sound of this soundtrack, I think, um, is the amount of vibrato we decided to put in. And this is where working with real performers makes such a big difference. This is something you can never get by working with virtual instruments. Now if we go back to the bar 15 here, you can hear the my indications about the vibrato here. Uh, so I wrote poco vibrato for the crescendos. So when there's a crescendo here, I wrote a little bit vibrato, but senza vibrato in the piano. So when we go back to piano, no vibrato at all. So on these long notes here, between the phrases, there's no vibrato, which again create this unique sound. Uh, and this was all uh, the idea of Michel Corriveau, which I brought in uh, into the arrangement. And you can really hear it here um, in the bar 22, 23, there's no vibrato here. <laughs> It kind of give a, a Baroque effect uh, because Baroque players don't play with vibrato. Also some traditional players, some fiddlers, they don't play with vibrato as well. So this gives this effect of the, the string as kind of a more raw sound than a performance by a classical music performer, for instance. Now you can see this section here, we basically add in all the violins here. They were not playing before, we just had uh, the solo violin. And this is the first time we get uh, the effect, almost all the effect of uh, the bigger string orchestra. I say almost because we don't have the double bass yet. And like I said, we kept the double bass for the climax, which is a little bit later. But actually, I think we added a few notes of double bass here uh, in the studio. Uh, we decided on the spot to add them just to give a little bit of support. You also heard this, uh, this little part for piano, which is quite nice.
sounds great uh, as well, was uh, recorded at the same place. If you want to know, we recorded this at the Studio Pierre Marchand in Montreal. A beautiful room that is uh, narrow on one side, but quite long on the other side. And we basically put the orchestra from left to right on the longer side, so they would have all of this space beside them. So when they took the, the room mic, since the sound is bouncing from the wall, uh, which is more narrow, we would have a natural sense of space because they would have so much space beside them. Now the second section here is where the solo violin becomes more active. The movie is about this little girl, uh, the little uh, girl from a Vietnamese family who had to flee Vietnam uh, in the Vietnam War and that came to uh, Canada, Quebec. And the story of the movie and how this queue is structured as well is about her and getting to know what she's going to become after this trauma. So basically the solo violin here illustrates her. And you see that uh, this little part here, we have a written rubato. Uh, this is what we call this. Because when you're working with a tempo track and when you write for movie, you kind of have to work with a click track. It's hard to slow tempo down, so we basically had to write a uh, rubato here. Add in an extra beat of silence here and here as well. Now this last part is very interesting. Firstly, uh, you can hear the, the violin. Uh, it's quite hard to play. It looks super easy, it's just arpeggios, right? But violins, it's hard for them to play this because they always have to skip string. Um, but we had an amazing player for this, so he had no problem. But just be careful with these if you write these for less experienced uh, performers. So when we write for soloists, they can really stand out. It's really not the same. Playing as a soloist and playing as a string within an ensemble is really not the same for them. They kind of hold back uh, when they play for an ensemble and they try to blend in with the others. But when you write them a solo, they just go all out. And mostly when you write piano, they will play mezzo forte. And when you write mezzo forte, they will play forte. So they kind of adjust. Also note, this is like a big crescendo uh, for the big moment, uh, which, is, which is at uh, 57 here. So basically what we did is that we, uh, we orchestrate the dynamics here. So this means that we start with piano, we go to mezzo forte here on the second phrase, and every bar we add in one instrument. So we have the first violin here, coming in on uh, the, the chord here. And then the next bar, we add in the double basses here. And we give the full orchestra uh, two bars here, one, two, to go into the climax here at uh, 57. And if I can say this bar here at 55, I worked a lot on this one because you can see the whole orchestra is just going up and you have to be careful when all the lines are going up so you don't get too much parallel fifths, parallel octaves. They can sound harsh in the uh, harmonic writing. And I do talk a lot about this when I talk about uh, counterpoint in my other videos. <laughs> So basically in the medium register, I did some opposite movement here. And this just helped uh, to smooth in this a uh, little bit better. And we also have the, the bass here and the second violin who holds half note here. So this does help to smooth things a bit. And then to measure 56 leading to the, the climax here. Again, I could have had the double basses here do uh, quarter notes, but it would be again too heavy. I decided to just hold the note and to lead into uh, the climax here while the other were moving. Now, the bar 57 is really interesting. Like I said, it's the climax and it's where all lines become free. You can see mostly all lines do different things uh, except for the violin one and the uh, violas. Uh, these ones are doing octaves, uh, so they are linked together, but the other lines here are, are independent and do different rhythms. Like I said, it's the climax, so I wanted all lines to be free. We even have the cello who goes up and play over the viola, so this really adds up to the intensity of the moment. <laughs> And the cello stays over the viola until the end, actually, and even does a long syncopation here that resolve here on the kind of open chord, right? We have uh, F minor on a C, C augmented chord, which adds into the drama of all this section. Now, if I can give you some tips uh, on how to score for a live session. So in this case, it was almost a reading. I say almost a reading because we just arrived an hour earlier before the recording and had an hour, I think it was a little bit more than an hour 
to rehearse all of the cues. It was around 20 minutes of music. And we were lucky because sometimes in these sessions, uh, musicians arrive and we just sight read and record it. But in all of these cases, in generally in studio, you have a limited amount of time. And so the score has to be as precise as possible. The first thing is to write all of the bars, all of them. By default in Sibelius and in other software, you only have the bar number at the beginning here but not for the rest of the system. So to provide this really saves time when you say, let's start at bar 22. Then people don't have to count every bar from the beginning up to 22, they just see it. Also, I like to write the pre-count, a pre-count of four beats in, the, in that case. That just means that when the performers hear four clicks in their ear, then they start playing. And by the way, in these sessions, even if there's a conductor who has the click track in their ear, it's useful to have all the performers have the click. Also, I like to provide as much information as possible uh, within the dy dynamics, like write all the crescendos, uh, all the dynamics, uh, arrival dynamics. Sometimes you see in scores, there's a crescendo, but there's no dynamic, uh, precise dynamic at the end of the crescendo. Like even here, mezzo piano, it's, it's so subtle, but it's different than the mezzo forte and the forte. And I just wanted to the performers here to make a difference between uh, this one here and this one here. And then you see everything I wrote for the vibratos. It's kind of necessary to have all this because this is something when you uh, perform a piece and when you rehearse a piece, this is something you can discuss among the musicians, decide where to do vibrato, where to do less vibrato, etc. But here again, we're trying to save time. So I just wrote everywhere we went in more or less vibrato. Otherwise, just to make things easier for the conductor, I've hidden the staff that we're not playing. Like here, we just have the cellos here, the viola and cello, here this, this tree. And then when, only when all of the, of the group comes in, I, uh, I add them all in. See here, I've added the double bass. It was just a way to show that everybody's playing except the double bass. I didn't want the conductor, in this case it was me, but I didn't want the conductor to say, now everybody at 35, because it's not quite everybody. So it's kind of a small detail that can save you maybe 15 seconds of the double bass saying, hey, am I playing at 35? And then the conductor saying, well, no. And then me saying, oh, no, no, this is not the one I want. You don't want any of this time waste. Other thing is to make sure that the bar numbers are big enough, uh, that every text is readable for, uh, for you, but also in the parts. So I could do another video on how to do parts for, uh, for performers, if you're interested, because there's other things to take into account uh, than, uh, than within only the score of the conductor. But yeah, this is basically my tips for the scoring. So now, how can you take what I showed you here if you write for virtual instruments? Well, the first thing I would ask is, do you want to become a film composer or a video game music composer? Because if you say yes, then I'd say, well, start and learn about notation because in a couple of years, if you're serious about this, you're gonna be working with real performers. And if by then you don't know how to write notation, well, maybe you can call me and I can work with you. But I would suggest to at least understand what the implications of writing for real performers are. And also it's useful for you to follow in the score so you can participate in these recordings and give some indications to the conductors, to the performers. But otherwise, personally, I've used a lot of the knowledge I've acquired in uh, writing for real performers into my writing for virtual instruments. Choices I make when I write for virtual instruments are all based on my knowledge on what's realistic, what sounds good in a real orchestra. And I do personally think that music notation is the best way to really see all the parts and to really understand what the links between them are. It just gives you this direct sense of what everybody's doing at all time. So thanks to the amazing composer Michel Kirivo for allowing me to share our project for you today. I encourage you to go see his website and the different project he's worked on. I'll put the link in the description below. And now if you want to hear how I approach a virtual orchestra, you can go and see this next video.